Everybody, uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our OU RFP newsletter lives. The last one was November and it was kind of fast track, an hour, packed with recommendations from colleagues, uh, opportunity to hear about classroom practice that support young children as readers, and a terrific opportunity tonight to listen to SF Saeed being interviewed by Rich and Debbie. So our plan for this evening uh, is as follows. Uh, let me introduce you to the colleagues who are uh, joining us. Um, <clears throat> So we've got top text with Michelle, news with Stephanie, examples of practice uh, by uh, Jill and Amy. And then we're turning to some teacher reading group updates from Chris uh, from Switzerland and Wendy and, and Vicky uh, from Trafford. And then some more top text, these from a series actually from Erin from Lancashire. And then we get the spotlight we're really after, which is probably why we're all here, uh, to listen to SF and to explore and understand some of his work and to celebrate the new tiger that's on its way for October. Then we close with a book wave and two or three quick research recommendations from me to close the night. So it's one hour, it's fast track, and I hope it'll be fun. We're starting though with a story which is a bit slower. Tisha and the Blossom, Being Mindful in a Hectic World by Wendy Madure and Daniel Ineas. Tisha was catching blossom in the backyard. Hurry up, said Mummy, or you'll be late for school. On the way, Tisha stopped to listen to the sounds. Hurry up, shouted the bus driver. I'm running late. In the classroom, Tisha found a book about space. Hurry up, said the teacher, we'll be late for assembly. In the playground, Tisha found a ladybird. She began to count the spots. One, two, three. Hurry up, called her friend, you miss pudding. After lunch, Tisha drew a space shuttle. It had three windows, two wheels, and one bright red. Hurry up, said the teacher. Time to put our crayons away. At home time, mummy, <coughs> excuse me, kissed Tisha and took her bag. Let's hurry, dear. We have to, don't want to miss the bus. No, thank you, sniffed Tisha. What's the matter? Asked me. I've done too much hurrying up today, Tisha said. Can we please have a little slow down? Mummy smiled. If your legs aren't too tired, we could always walk home. It's, it's only a few streets away. Yes, please, said Tisha. When I was a little girl, said Mummy, I used to love playing how many? Like, uh, how many yellow cars can you see? There's one over there, pointed Tisha. On the walk home, they saw five seagulls, four children, three blue umbrellas, two sausage dogs, and one enormous hat. Sorry, I missed my one slide, apologies. And then they sat on the bench in the sunshine and gave names to all the pigeons in the park. You two must be hungry, said Dad. I better hurry up and get dinner. Well, why don't we have a picnic instead, said Mummy. Oh yes, I love picnics, clapped Tisha. We can crunch the cucumbers, chew the cheese and feel the pickles tingle on our tongue, said Mummy. Daddy could crunch the loudest. Mummy could chew for the longest, and Tisha's tongue was the one that could tingle the most. And then a soft wind blew and the blossom began to fall. Let's catch it, Tisha said. I think my favorite days, sighed Tisha, are full of a bit of blossom and a lot of slowing. Tisha and Blossom by Wendy Madure and Daniel Aeneas. Don't feel pressured, but if you want to, do uh, share uh, a few thoughts in the chat line. And now I'm sharing, uh, oh, turning over to Michelle Madonna from Oxford, her TRG leader, who's going to make some recommendations of excellent uh, text. Over to Michelle. Lovely, thank you. That was wonderful. I don't know that one, and that really was what we needed. Okay, so I have three titles to recommend. 
commend to you today. These are all um, pupil voted award winners so that it's important because this is what the children are enjoying reading right now. Um, hot off the press, I am chair of the Ox Oxfordshire Book Awards and this is the winner of our primary category. So this is my first recommendation, Vi Spy, Licensed to Chill, by Maz Evans. If you don't know this, it is a funny adventure story, great wordplay, particularly in the characters' names, um, and I'm sure it will have all the children reading it giggling away. It's a story about a girl who thinks her dad is dead and her mom is a retired secret spy. Um, however, her dad is actually a supervillain and is in hiding, he turns up. That causes a problem. This is a book about parents who are divorcing, blended families, being of mixed race, lots and lots of really interesting things in a fun read. So that's my first top recommendation. Second one, I'm sure lots of you will know this one, The Last Bear by Hannah Gold. This has won the Blue Peter Book Award recently and then the Waterstones Children Books Children's Book Prize. Um, this is another adventure story but it's slower paced. Um, it has uh, it addresses wonderful issues like climate changes and and um, endangered species, and it's a story about a girl who goes with her father to Bear Island for six months um, to while her dad does some scientific research. She's lonely on the island and then develops this special bond with Bear. It's not at all cliched though, because Bear can't talk to her. So this relationship feels natural and real as April tries to work out what he needs from her. One really, really to recommend and read if you don't know it. Okay, and my final one. Um, so a non-fiction one, winner of the Royal Society's Young People's Book Prize. I am a book, I am a portal to the universe. Um, this is such fun. As you can see, it is bright, it is illustrated, it's full of facts to inspire discussion and further investigation, and it takes the reader on a journey. There's an implied conversation between narrator and reader, and the children in my library absolutely loved this when we shadowed the award. Brilliant, Michelle. I'm going to cease you there because of time and hand over to Steph. Thank you for those award winning recommendations. Steph, next on news. OK, you'll no doubt be aware of Empathy Day on Thursday, the 9th of June. Do go to the Empathy Lab website for free book related resources to support your work around Empathy Day. You may have noticed a few new resources on the OURFP website. The first poster, which can be downloaded from the site, explains the nuts and bolts of informal book talk and recommendations. It's accompanied by guidance with ideas about how you might use the poster to support staff and spread understanding about book talk pedagogy. Also in the book talk corner, there will be a new PowerPoint and a set of guidance notes for you to use if you want to deliver a staff meeting about this pedagogy. These and a book talk podcast are coming soon. They're brand new resources, so do let us know how you get on with them. Send us an email or a tweet. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Following on from the book talk poster, keep an eye out for the read aloud poster that will be up on the website shortly and look out for announcements about the remaining two posters in the series, currently in development, independent reading and social reading environments. Exciting news, the OU UKLA Reading for Pleasure conference that was initially planned for March 2019 has finally got the go ahead. We will be conferencing in person at the University of Cambridge School on Saturday the 18th of June and we're hoping you can join us. There's a fabulous lineup of TRG leaders and award winners and keynote speakers, including the wonderful author Frank Cottrell Boyce. Entry is just £30 and remaining tickets will be available in the next few weeks. So if you'd like to join us for brilliant books, fantastic speakers and lunch in Cambridge, keep an eye out on Eventbrite and our social media. The final news item is about our whole school research led Reading for Pleasure programme. Individual schools can now join. If you're interested, come to a free information briefing on Wednesday, the 4th of May after school. Register via Eventbrite. Thank you. Great spot on news. And I'm now turning over to Jill Queen, who is the Farshaw Community Award winner in this last year. She's going to share an example of practice she's been working on and developing that reading community up in Lanarkshire. 
Thanks, Teresa. So hi, everyone. So tonight I'm going to be sharing with you some photographs and information from my own evidence of practice, which was based on building reading communities and which has now been published on the OU website. Thanks, Davey. <clears throat> Okay, so I gave out a questionnaire to our pupils which showed that lots of them didn't have books at home to read for pleasure. Very few of them actually witnessed adults in their home reading for pleasure and they didn't engage in shared reading time very often at all. Alarmingly, it also showed that only about 5% of our families actually visited the local library to borrow books. And when I chatted to them about this, it was mainly because in order to do this, very few of them owned cars. They had to go on the bus, which would cost money, and this just wasn't seen as a priority. So I realised that I really had to do something about this. So I decided to open our school library as a community lending library. Thanks, Debbie. So in order to do this, it took a huge amount of organisation. I was adamant that the community that came in to borrow books from us wouldn't just be borrowing books to read to the children at home. I wanted the adults to be able to borrow books that they could read for pleasure so that they could also be seen as reading role models at home. But we didn't have any adult books, so I had to plead with friends, with family, with staff. I spent a lot of time in charity shops gathering together books and by the time the library opened I'd managed to get together about 400 adult books which included novels, garden books, recipe books and even magazines to attract lots of different interests. I was also fully aware that in order for this to be a success the children and I would have to embark on a huge marketing campaign. We mainly did this through social media because this is the easiest way and most effective way for us to communicate with our families but we also made posters these were displayed around the village. We did a leaflet drop in practically, in fact, in every single house in Netherburn, which took a while. We um, chapped the doors of family members that we knew. We stopped people in the street. Um, some people would say we were harassing people, but I would like to think we were just getting our message out there. And Kirsty at the front of the slide there, she came up with her hashtag, which was Get Our Village Reading. And as we were walking around, we would sort of sing that out. So that became our sort of motto. Thanks, Davey. So eventually, after a lot of hard work and organisation, it was the grand opening of our community library. And you can see Dylan there. And at that point in time, Dylan was our head librarian. He was in charge of our school librarians and also for the shifts. And he had the privilege that day of cutting the ribbon and welcoming the community in. Um, it was amazing. You know, the library opened every week from three till four, the kids worked shifts and seeing the community coming in and borrowing books, relaxing in our library was just unbelievable. And the impact that this had not only in our children, but in the whole school community was just unbelievable. Um, and I've got just a couple of quotes from my EOP to share with you. Um, it's really difficult for me to see it from here, but um, it's a grandparent who was saying, you know, they love going to the library, but it was difficult for them as they got older to go into the town so they could then walk up and borrow books. And the other one there says, a great idea, a fab way of getting the community involved in getting people reading. Thanks, Davey. So in addition to the Community Lending Library, I also run a book club, after school book club for primary one to seven. And at the end of each four week block, I invited in parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, you name it, they would come in. And I ran this the same as I would run a TRG. Um, I don't actually run it now. I have trained our primary seven pupils to run it. So for example, today the primary ones were in and I sat with my feet up and my book and I could completely relax because the children have now taken ownership for this. And again, it was another way to get our families in. Thanks, Debbie. Again, during lockdown, we tried our best, as you can see in the left, to still get our community reading. And we did this by turning an old wooden hut out in the playground, or gazebo rather, um, into a comfy reading den. And that's some of our preschoolers and their parents reading together outside. Thank you, Debbie. And finally, my biggest fear during lockdown was that the momentum that we'd worked so hard to build would fall away. So I tried to think of really exciting ways to keep keep this going and one of the most popular ways was with the village book hunt. I took lots of books from school um, and put them in envelopes and drove from my home to the village early one morning when they were all still asleep and hid them everywhere and the purpose of this was for families to get outdoors together into the fresh air to get exercise to boost their mental health as well and once they found the books they had to go home read them together and if possible upload these onto Google Classroom for the remainder of the school to see. So again this was just another way of us continuing to build that reading community even during lockdown. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Fabulous example of get your village reading and of hugely involving the children. Uh, wrapping up books and hiding them around the village. Terrific idea. You could do that over half term if anybody's got the time and energy, or perhaps we can learn from our Scottish colleague. Thank you so much. We're turning now to Amy Durning from Cambridgeshire, who's been working on developing an example of practice with teaching assistants. So over to you, Amy. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you, Jill. That was great. Um, I'd just like to talk to you about the... Um, uh, example of practice which I'm writing at the moment I'm not sort of at the finished point like Jill is so this time round I'm using the PowerPoint which is provided by the OU on their website to share my practice previously I've written two or three others and I've used the Word document but what I love about the PowerPoint is it's already structured for you and there's so much on there that points you towards the correct research and the format you should be using. So it's an absolute winner for me. So here I am sharing the title, which it's a working title. I haven't decided yet exactly whether this will be the one I've, I'm going to use. It's Reading for Pleasure, Show and Tell. And I've got a book there which started off my Reading for Pleasure journey, not only for myself, but the, for the children within my school. Next slide, please, Debbie. So here's the school which has been mentioned previously, which hopefully you'll all come along to the Reading for Pleasure conference in June. So I just thought I'd show you there as a little pointer and a spotlight. So hopefully you'll all sign up, sign up and come and meet us. Next slide, please, Debbie. So I'm slightly unusual because I am a teaching assistant um, at the school and I also run the school's... Um, OU Reading for Pleasure group, not only for our teachers in the school, but this year we've started our first UK TA hub teaching assistant Reading for Pleasure group, which we've got several members coming along. We've got our set group on Thursday. So at that group, as teachers, there's no teachers there. We're talking about our Reading for ped Pleasure pedagogy and how we're helping develop Reading for Pleasure cultures in our classroom. So hopefully all of us will be sharing our examples of practice this year on the website. Next slide, please, um, Debbie, thank you. So this is what I decided to do because I cover PPA session on a Wednesday afternoon. And instead of it bit just being a bit free or catching up on some work the children um, need to do, I thought let's start to embed a reading for pleasure within this classroom and develop a reading culture. So I introduce each week several books to the children, talk about the books I've read, share characters, plots, and hopefully introduce them to the, some new texts which maybe their teachers or parents aren't sharing with them. So I brought along this graphic novel by uh, Jason Reynolds and straight away a child said, oh, I'd love to read that, can I borrow it? And then three others signed up for it. So that was great and I was really impressed and because I've done one of these examples before I know that during the process of the year certain things will change so I'm hoping that I won't always leave this session and the children will start to take it on themselves so that's in a sort of developing stage and within my example of practice I'll write about that and share that with you all. Next slide please. About a so, minute ago my friend. Sorry, a I'm in it. Okay. Go. Speed so up. here's a snapshot of my books. And if we go to the next slide, I just want to show you how brilliant the PowerPoint is because it gives you an idea of an area you could be working on. I'm working on the reading communities, but I'm also going to concentrate on the other things as well. And also consider teaching assistant pedagogy. Is, is it the same as teachers or are there slight nuances within that, our practice? There we go, Teresa. Question. Yeah, question to be answered. Oh, and that's my timer. Thank you. <laughs> that's your time. Brilliant. Thank you. And it is really exciting to be thinking about how different teaching assistant pedagogy might be to teachers, how we can complement one another and enrich the opportunities for the kids. Thanks, Amy. That's great. And I'm sorry to hassle you. We're turning now to a teacher reading group update all the way from Geneva. Uh, so Chris Baker, over to you. Hi there, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, my name's Chris Baker. I'm a year six teacher in Geneva. I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm a 
leader of a teacher reader group. It's my second year. Last year, I did a virtual group, mostly with teachers based in the UK. And this year, um, I've been lucky to have several colleagues join an in-person group. And we're almost at the end of our year. We're having our fifth meeting next month. Next slide, please. Here are some pictures from our group um, as we've met so far this year. Sometimes we've met in person, sometimes we've had to meet online, but it's been really wonderful. Um, and one of the big takeaways from the year has been our collaborative blatherboard, which has built our knowledge of children's literature no end. We now have over 50 texts, you know, categorized by the different genres. And all of us are occasionally dipping in there to get recommendations, add in new books that we've read. It's, it's really been a, a wonderful um, experience to build that resource. I'd like to talk in a bit more detail about two specific projects that we have um, underway at the moment at my school. One of them is a collaboration between teachers in year five and in year one. They aimed to give the students more opportunities to have that kind of fun, informal reading opportunities. They took the year fives to the library. We have a weekly library session and they picked a book that they would like to share with younger students. And then weather permitting, they went outside and just enjoyed that relaxed time, sharing books, laughing, enjoying stories, taking turns. Uh, it's been running for a few weeks um, and you might be able to see a couple of bits of feedback um, from two students. I could have put a long list. It's all been so positive. Um, they really enjoy the fact that it's a very different kind of reading experience. It's not in a classroom. It's not being followed up with comprehension questions. It doesn't have to be silent. It's fun and it's kind of interactive. The teachers have actually been also encouraging the children to be very reflective of the process. So as the project develops, we're getting feedback from the students for how the project can be improved. So you can see a few things there. They want to make sure they're taking turns. They're making sure not to interrupt. Things which really help the experience benefit the younger and the older students as well. The final project is one that is uh, currently underway as well. I will plan to publish the example of practice in the summer holidays. At the beginning of the year, students wanted uh, to be able to read outside during break and lunchtime. It isn't possible at the moment. So we put a budget together and we're going to build what we're calling an outdoor reading zone. Um, it's essentially a trolley with a waterproof cover that will have doors that open, cushions and blankets can come out, books will be available. I see uh, Jill in Scotland did uh, a little bit of outdoor reading, so it's great to see that it is possible. Um, and you can see the artist's impression of how it's going to look. Um, more on that will follow. Keep, please keep checking the uh, OU website. Great, Chris. Thank you so much. It's really exciting uh, to hear about those examples from Switzerland. And now we're turning over to uh, Wendy Swan and Vicky Johnson, who come from Trafford in Manchester. They've been jointly running a group there uh, and they've lots to tell us, I know. Go for it. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so I'm Vicky. I am a Year 5 teacher at Our Lady of Lords Catholic Primary School, which is uh, one form entry, and I am the English lead. Um, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Wendy Swan, I'm assistant head teacher at Wellfield Junior School and literacy lead. And this is the second year that Vicky and I have been co-leading the group for Trafford, um, which has grown significantly in size. Um, there have been various sort of developments um, uh, and initiatives from, from several schools, um, and a lot of them have included outdoor reading spaces and indoor reading spaces. Um, and the children have actually started to use these on a more regular basis. Um, there's been a huge focus on how we sort of support each other within the group um, to encourage senior leaders to really value reading for pleasure within the national curriculum and as such to invest money um, for new reading materials to provide quality and exciting reading experiences for the children. At one school, the children have become reading champions. And as part of this work, um, they've produced a newsletter, which has gone home to parents, which has allowed them to share their our progress within school with people at home. So we're ensuring that we've got reading at home and reading in school as well. So it's a really lovely sort of shared experience going on there. Thanks, Debbie. 
So we're really aware of the importance of having the texts that tempt. And um, when we did our initial discussions about teacher subject knowledge, it became quite apparent that in some settings it was very Dahl heavy or Walliams heavy. And we really needed to have those diverse authors um, in our libraries so that children could experience a range of modern texts. But we were also really aware of budget pressures and how we can overcome those. And the first primary school in Sale in Trafford had an amazing idea, which lots of our members have decided that they're going to try um, and use in their school, which was to do a sponsored read. And not only was that engaging the families and uh, the wider community with the importance of reading, but actually it raised quite a lot of money, which is specifically earmarked for texts. And they worked very closely with a local bookseller as well to make sure that those texts were engaging and relevant for the right year groups. And as we're writing up our evidence of practice, we're really aware of our three focused children and how we're going to measure that impact. And we've found that the um, surveys on the Open University Reading of Pleasure website are brilliant in getting to really understand the children's opinions of reading, which sometimes surprise us because we think we know, you know, they're a good reader, they must love reading. Um, and then we can also use the spreadsheets on the website to sort of in work out percentages of, you know, who really likes reading and who doesn't. And we can use that then at the end of our project to measure the progress of our initiatives that we've put into place. And there's also surveys available for parents as well. So we found that really useful. So we're really looking forward to writing up our um, evidence of practice now. Thanks, Teresa. Great. Thank you, Vicky and Wendy. That's fabulous. And it's good to hear you making use of the parents one, too. I mean, it's always about getting that evidence of impact, isn't it? But don't forget, there's observation, too. You can watch the kids and see how engaged they are, as well as do surveys. I've got a kind of uh, anathema against numbers, me, but there we are. We need both and we shared both. So, yeah. OK, we're now moving on then to Erin, um, who's going to share with us some recommended text, trio of them, for that are coming from a series. Thanks, hello. hello, how are you doing? I'm delighted to be here, really conscious of time, so I'll just get cracking. Now, I think in terms of text that tempt, um, Marvel has never lost its appeal, especially in its reimagining of characters such as Mrs. Marvel and this series here, um, the first in the series, it's your breakout novel, um, Stretched Thin. Now, she, uh, the character's name is Kamala Khan, and she is the first Muslim superhero, so it's important for that reason, but not that reason alone, because she's your typical teenager, she's a big sister, she's a friend, and she's got trouble at school, and she also writes fan fiction, and she's got to keep her audience happy, but she's also coming to terms with her superpowers, and she's finding all of this tough. So she's really a character that's relatable, and she's written with heart. And also in this story, we've got um, cameos from Miles Morales, that's the current Spider-Man, and also Tony Stark. It's also hot, 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 as the trailer's just dropped, and she's the lead in Marvel's new computer game as well, so they're really pushing this character. Um, the TV series will be out in June, and following on from the buzz that Heartstoppers has created recently, I think that this is a text that's going to create a bit of buzz in the classroom. It's right. by Nadia... Shamas and illustrated by Nabi Charlie, um, and even that is really kind of forward thinking in the female um, creators of this um, new text. So that's it there. It's a scholastic imprint as well, so it's probably suitable for upper primary, um, and that's the first um, in the series. The second one is a Scottish author, The Infinity Files. Now, this is a heroic character because she is trying to um, be a starfighter. It's a science fiction novel, but she fails at that, so she has to become a heroic librarian. I mean, how good is that in terms of a character that has to save the galaxy, a heroic librarian? Good job. She's in charge of the Infinity Files, um, and it's a complex novel. It's fast-paced. It's definitely teenage, but book two in the series of this just came out last month, so this is your start-off novel in the Infinity Files, and that's by S.M. Wilson, and that's on the Scottish Teen Book Trust Prize for this year. It's on the shortlist, um, so we'll see how that does as well. Now, the third book that I would recommend is in, it's a historical fiction novel, and it's Circus Maximus. Um, I don't know how um, familiar you are with this, but the second book um, was released last week. This is the first in the series. And in this book, um, the character Dido, is, she's fighting patriarchy. She's um, taking part in a male-dominated sport. Um, and she's really coming to terms with some of the challenges 
of um, just being a kind of female character in a male dominated world um, and also there's horses in it so it's a real kind of passion for me but I think anything with horses in it um, uh, 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 always new, new reimaginings of these stories go down well in class and the second one is called Rivals in the Track and that's well worth a read and that's Annalise Stray and Zephyr is the um, right. publisher. Thank you. Vicky's too. obviously enjoyed it too. Thank you so much, Erin. <laughs> Three great recommendations, all of which are new to me and probably shouldn't be. Thank you. So now <laughs> we get you. a great opportunity to hear from uh, SF Said. Welcome uh, to this OURFP newsletter live. And I'm passing over to Richard and now to Debbie, who are going to uh, talk to you and give you a space too. Uh, over to you, Three. Welcome, lovely to see you this evening and uh, thank you for joining us. SF is really exciting to welcome you this evening. Um, I'm going to hand over because I know you're going to do more of an introduction about yourself as a reader, uh, but I also want to give um, welcome to Rich Charlesworth who's joining us to interview uh, SF. That sounds a bit serious, doesn't it? We're going to do an interview this evening with SF, but actually we're going to have a bit of a chat with everyone else listening in. And I'm just really excited because SF has written some of my favourite books. I've got a Barjack Poor up there behind me, um, an absolute favourite, not just because I'm a black cat owner, but uh, yeah, and <laughs> Rich has got another favourite there. So SF, let's just hand over to the hand over to you to introduce yourself. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you uh, for inviting me to, to talk to you guys today. Hello. So yes, I'm SF. Molly, Reading for Pleasure Journey. I've been hearing about people's Reading for Pleasure Journeys. Well, actually, it's the very first thing I can remember of being alive. That is the beginning of my Reading for Pleasure Journey. I was three years old and my uncle uh, was reading me The Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss. And I just thought, this is amazing. I want the cat to come to my house and smash everything to bits. I think that would be the best thing ever. And I think I knew at that moment I was always going to love reading. I was always going to love books because it seemed anything you could imagine was allowed in the pages of a book. And I just thought that was a liberation, an inspiration. I wouldn't have used those words at age three, but I felt it, believe me. Uh, a few years later, at the age of eight, my mum came to me one day with this book, Watership Down by Richard Adams. She said, I've just read this. It's the best book ever. You must read it. And handed me this 500 page long book. Well, I very reluctantly <laughs> picked up Watership Down. And as I read it, I thought, you know what? She's right. This is the best book ever. And one day I would like to try and write something that is even half as good as this. I think that'd be a really good thing to do with my life. And I really do believe my life was changed forever by Watership Down, as I think all our lives were changed by the books and the stories that we love when we're young. That's why I think children's books are the most important books of all. They do change our lives forever and they stay with us forever. So that is the beginning of my journey in writing for pleasure. I really do believe a writer is nothing more than a reader who takes one more step and writes stories they really want to read themselves. That is all I do. That's all every writer I've ever talked to has done. So as you mentioned in your kind introduction, uh, Debbie, Barjack Paul, um, I wanted to read a story about a cat going out into the world, having adventures, getting into fights and learning secret martial arts known only to cats. So I sat down and wrote that book myself. I wanted to know what was going to happen after the end of the story. So I wrote a sequel. Later, I felt the need to try and recapture the excitement I felt as a kid watching the very first Star Wars film when it came out. I was 10 years old at that time. This thing just blew my mind. And as that first starship went over our heads, I just remember thinking, wow, one day I've got to make something like this. A story so big it could fill an entire galaxy. So I ended up writing Phoenix. I will talk a little bit more about my new book, Tiger, which is not quite a book yet, but it is coming in October. Dave McKean, my amazing illustrator, is working on the illustrations right now, which is beyond exciting. And I would love to share a couple of those with you. But what would you like to know? What would you like to talk about? Debbie, Rich, take it away. Well, I think, I mean, you're so passionate about reading for pleasure. And I mean, that's the best thing is that you're an advocate for that out there on social media, everyone you talk to, um, you're talking about reading for pleasure. And I just wondered, you know, what's really influenced your feelings about that? Because you've talked about yourself developing as a reader, but, you know, why do you think that's so important? 
Well, I mean, to be honest with you, I was not the most kind of attentive kid at school. Uh, if I was in your class, you probably would not have loved me um, uh, because I was often away in a world of my own, you know, making stuff up. And But whenever a teacher was reading a story to us, I was spellbound, mesmerized. I've often tweeted about a teacher called Mr. Evans, who when I was at school, Generally, we just had to take notes as the teacher dictated them, and then we would regurgitate them in an essay or a test. And that was it. That was basically what my school life was like in the 1970s. But Mr. Evans would read to us. He read us amazing stories from the Greek and Roman myths about gods and monsters and heroes. And like everybody else in the class, I was just spellbound. I was amazing. These stories are so big, so thrilling. Um, I guess when I was lucky enough that Varjak Paul began to be a book that teachers worked with. I, I was quite surprised that people are doing something with this in schools. I just wrote it because I wanted to read it myself and I hoped maybe it would entertain some kids, you know. And But then I found, yeah, visiting schools where they were working with my books, everything had changed. There were these vibrant cultures of reading for pleasure, which I imagine every single person here tonight knows all about. You know, I was surprised. I was like, well, this is not like my memory of school at all. And I began to hear all these extraordinary stories, kids who had never liked reading, thought it was for other people, not for them, had never read a book in their lives. Something about Varjak just grabbed them uh, and they never looked back. And now, oh, they've written a story of their own and please, can you read it? Unbelievable, you know, that's such a, an extraordinary and emotional thing for a writer to feel that your book might have the kind of impact on kids now that your own favorite books had on you. So yeah, I, I really firmly believe having seen it hundreds, possibly thousands of times on school visits, this stuff is life changing. It's amazing and it's, it's really simple. You know, reading for pleasure is not rocket science. Um, so yeah, I'm in awe of all the teachers and librarians who work tirelessly day after day, you know, um, to, to, to communicate that excitement and enthusiasm to kids because the impact is beyond all measuring you know might feel very ordinary to you on a day-to-day -day basis but you cannot imagine where that's going to lead all those kids well i think it's really key sf what you just said about the fact you have a memory of a key teacher that key teacher who who really changed things by reading aloud to you you know i have a teacher mrs glissold she was the teacher and and that's really important isn't it for us to remember some of those people who are, are watching and listening this evening will be thinking actually that that's you you're doing that by reading aloud to the children so it's brilliant and you're right varjak poor i mean there's not a week that goes by on social media where varjak poor isn't mentioned by a teacher you know it's a really it is a really popular read aloud but also a really popular part of the curriculum I mean, I think that's what, Rich, we're going to go on and explore, aren't we? You want yeah, to I think more. Um, first things first, I think the best thing your um, background is endorsing my book buying habits. So I think that's uh, that's put me at ease straight away. Mine's all hidden down the corridor. Um, but yeah, I think um, what I've been doing recently is going back to, I've read um, Far Jack a long, long time ago and returning to it now in the current climate has been really interesting. Um, I'm really pleased in the links that you made to Star Wars for Phoenix. That was a bit of our discussion pre um, this meeting today. Um, I was mentioning, oh, there's a nice bit of Star Wars reference and sort of foreshadowing. Um, but I think my first question, I think, um, is about the themes that you put in. And I think um, throughout both Phoenix and Varjak, there's a big sort of, um, one of the themes that sort of struck me in the thread that goes through the text is about belonging and identity. And I was just interested in, as a writer, how do you, do you consciously put that in? Is it something that organically comes out on the page as you're writing? Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be fantastic. That's such an interesting question, Rich. I've got to say, um... I set out, you know, with Varjak Paul, literally wanting a story about a cat going out into the world and having adventures, you know, nothing more complicated than that. And inspired by my own cat's adventures as he went out into the world for the first time. But you can't help it. The stuff that you are interested in yourself, the stuff you love and think is important, is going to find its way into your stories. So, you know, my family is originally from the Muslim world, from the Middle East. Uh, my ancestors are from places like Iraq, Egypt, um, Kurdistan, you know. So I grew up in London in the 1970s as a British Muslim kid at a time when there were not a huge number of other British Muslim kids around. So questions of identity and belonging have always been quite personal for me. You know, it's quite important. I've thought a lot about this stuff. I've read a lot about this stuff. Um, I made Varjak Pura Mesopotamian Blue 
Mesopotamia, of course, is the ancient name of the country we now call Iraq. I mean, not really because I wanted to explore identity and belonging, but because I was fascinated to find out about Mesopotamia. You know, that actually Iraq, where some of my family came from, that's where civilization began. The oldest writing in the world seems to have come from Mesopot ancient Mesopotamia. Ancient Mesopotamian myths and legends were even older than the Greek I Roman ones Mr. Evans read us at school. They were the origins of all the myths. So I'm drawn to that stuff, but it, it comes out of, I suppose, my own experience and my own kind of interest in my background and my relationship with it, somebody growing up in a world where it's quite an unusual background. It, it's when Barjack Paul came out, I mean, that was 2003, very, very long time ago. It was a really different world and a really different publishing environment. I've been so encouraged in the past few years to see this kind of embrace of, well, let's have books from different voices. Let's, we need diverse books, you know. I mean, that's kind of what started it, wasn't it? That movement on Twitter uh, that has really, really grown. And it's been amazing to see it taken up by teachers, librarians, booksellers and publishers, ultimately, I think are listening. So in Tiger, I'm exploring that stuff a lot more kind of explicitly, I guess, you know, rather than a Mesopotamian blue cat, I actually have a British Muslim kid. You know, I've, I've kind of gone over ground with it. Phoenix is somewhere in the middle. I mean, it's not a cat anymore. It, it, it's a human, but you know, it's humans and aliens. So, you know, I guess I was using the idea of alienness to think about identity and belonging in our own world, which I think science fiction is brilliant at. But if that is something you're interested in, then, you know, just wait for Tiger. You know, yeah. I think I've I've really gone to another level with that one. But yeah. let's move on. What else would you would you like to talk about? Oh wow. Um I think yeah, the sort of you've mentioned and touched on it a little. I think in your writing you've got such a sort of a vivid sort of way of describing place and history. You've touched on it then sort of uh, with uh, Mesopotamia. And like while I was reading through this time, I'm busy making notes and questions for myself, looking up um sort of the uh, etymology of like rivers and where they started and finished and seeing sort of names. And there's so many questions I'd love to pick your brains about for Varjak in terms of placement. There's, I think um, Trafalgar Square is mentioned quite explicitly, but then all sort of there's, there's lions that they're sort of near to. Um, so it can be anywhere, but somewhere as well. Um, so maybe a bit more about the law and the world building that you do. Um, so are you as someone who has like a wall covered with post-it notes? I'm not sure looking at your background, there's space, but or are you someone who has a meticulous um, spreadsheet? I know uh, Alice Oseman, who does the Heartstopper, has kind of a multi-spreadsheet uh, panel. How does that process work for you? I mean, for me, the, the notebook is really the, the essential thing. So my notebooks tend to look a bit like this. It's just full of text. You know, every so often you might get a diagram, but largely I, I, I think in, in blocks of text, you know, I think at a certain point, if I can get a, a story, oh, here's one. If I can get a story into something like that, then I feel I've done quite well. I've sort of distilled it down quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I think for me, this is stuff that develops as I go along. Uh, I quite like on an early draft knowing very, very little. Uh, and I like the energy of discovery. Uh, so my first drafts are very, very rough. You know, you would laugh. If you saw my first draft, you would say, how is this person allowed to publish books? But I think it's actually fine to, to have a rough first draft. Uh, and actually, it's probably better in a way, because I think what you can't do is do something brilliant in one go. Just not possible. What you can do is do something rough and then make it better and better gradually. That's why it takes me so long to write each book. You know, even a little book like Varjak, that took me five years. Uh, and Tiger has just taken nine. Uh, I never thought a book could possibly take nine years. But that actually has been through three different worlds, believe it or not. Uh, when you come to read Tiger, I hope you will, you'll find it is set in a strange alternate world in which the British Empire has never ended. Slavery has never been abolished. Huge numbers of animals have been hunted to extinction. And in this world, a, a, a Muslim boy called Adam finds something impossible and incredible in a rubbish dump in the middle of Imperial London, he finds a tiger, not meant to exist. Um, now that world that I have just described, probably no, that didn't exist for about six and a half years of my writing tiger. It only really kind of took its shape 
quite near the end of the writing process. It's really extraordinary to me how these things work. Um, the example I always give kids in schools of, of this gradual process, uh, in Varjak Paul, there are these two black cats who show up at the beginning and then later at the end. So they didn't exist until the fifth and final year of writing Varjak Paul. They actually shaped the entire story. But for me, everything in a story, very much the world, but even the characters, that all changes and develops as I work on it, drawn by, uh, sort of powered by my responses as a reader. Every time I finish a draft, I put it away, get as far from it as I can, and then I try and reread it, pretending that I didn't write it myself. Someone else wrote it, it's actually a book I paid $6.99 to read. And then when I do, I find all sorts of things I wish the writer had done differently. And then I have to kind of change them. So all of the, so what you're asking about, like the world stuff, there isn't really a big plan with that. It just develops organically through this kind of evolutionary process. If I'm reading something and I think, oh, wow, that's great, then it will probably stay. And if I'm reading something and I get a bit bored and wander off, that's definitely got to be better, you know. So it's it's interesting considering sort of working in the classroom, we're expecting sort of all of my questions that sort of feed off from here can go off in lots of different tangents. There's talk about editing. We're expecting children to edit within one hour. And I think you're consciously in my classroom sort of saying, look, eight, nine years, eight or nine different drafts. Really interesting to know even the settings sort of can change sort of up six, six years in. It's so fascinating. Um, I mean, there's so many questions, Debbie, that I've got, and I'm very conscious of the time. Can I sneak one in go before? On, go for it, Rich, go for it. Go on. Um, I think I've asked you a little bit about this before. I think we first met in Cambridge and I was talking a lot about writing uh, for pleasure and not going using the curriculum, but actually sort of liberating sort of parts that children are writing for pleasure and using picture books. And I think it feeds into your work with Dave, really. I think I remember, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, when you work together, you tend to work quite separately. Um, and I think that Dave does that uh, also with um, David Armand. Um, where they sort of release a kind of hybrid, hybrid graphic novels. And I'm part a keen question about Tiger, but also with Phoenix, there's in the introduction when we first meet Lucky, um, Dave does almost like graphic novel panelling in those first few pages. Um, I've got them here, I'll see if I can show. And um, what's really interesting is um, there are these kind of light, light and dark, almost inverse sort of panels. And I can't help but think that you must have talked a little or is it completely, do you just leave it to leave it to chance? What's the, uh, what's your relationship, working relationship with Dave McKean? That's so Coming interesting. For Tiger, if there is any chance. I know he's yeah. on. Um. <laughs> well, it's so interesting. Every book has been different. With Varjak Paul, uh, I just gave him a Word document, you know, and it, it came back looking like that, you know. So I can take no credit at all for anything in Varjak or Outlaw. Um, that was very much the same. With Phoenix, though, we had started spending a lot of time together trying to get a Varjak Paul movie made, which has yet to happen, uh, but I still hope it will one day. While we were doing that, we were talking a lot about Phoenix. Uh, and so there are some strands of illustration in Phoenix, which are very much came out of those conversations. So there's a, a sequence of interstitial images of these characters who are called the 12 Astraeus. They're the ancient gods uh, who the aliens believe are really stars who come down from the sky. I remember saying to Dave, I'm having real trouble describing the sort of mythic background of the story. Do you think you could draw a series of 12 gods who are also stars as imagined by aliens in the future? And he went, oh, I'd love to do that. So I kind of designed the sequence for him, almost like in a graphic novel, to do that. Because I thought, you know, I've got the best artist in the world here. Let, let's let the pictures tell the story. So, you know, that's what happened with that one. Uh, with Tiger, I mean, the cover of Tiger, which uh, hopefully you should be able to see now, that's, you know, there are quite a lot of elements there that really come out of um, just, I sent Dave the text and this image came back. Um, it seems at once very, very familiar to me and completely unpredictable. You know, I wouldn't have thought that necessarily would be what he would have done with it, but I kind of recognize everything about it. And it's as if somebody has been into a dream that I, I had and sort of made that dream real. Um, the city that Tiger is set in, um, hopefully you can see that now. That's this kind of uh, 
parallel alternate London. I think to me that's immediately London because, you know, there you've got St Paul's Cathedral and all those domes. But then you've also got these massive uh, chimney stacks, what Blake would call dark satanic mills. Of course, there's a huge William Blake uh, influence in Tiger, as well as a, a massive um, Philip Pullman influence and uh, Mallory Blackman influence. You know, when you're writing about parallel worlds, you've got to look at the best, don't you? But um, so it, with Tiger, it's not really so much, again, that um, I designed anything specifically for him, but I did send him lots and lots of material to look at saying, you know, maybe this kind of architecture might evoke the kind of thing we're thinking about. This kind of tiger is the kind of tiger I would love to see, you know, so I, I guess it's somewhere in the middle with tiger. It's a little bit of both. But for me, the most exciting thing about tiger, which, as I say, I feel is my best book so far. I feel like it's a big step up on anything I've ever done. I feel like Dave is taking a step up too. that the artwork uh, of Tiger is some of the best he's ever done. And I, I think it is going to amaze and delight readers of all ages again. So thank you for asking about that. I, love it. I can just imagine sort of partnerships of pupils pairing up now in classrooms and just having that same sort of process. Yeah, and we've got some very excited teachers in the chat who are just starting to say they cannot wait to read this book. So I, I mean, I, I'm really, everyone is genuinely really excited. I think there's also a big call out for the film to be made of Varjak Paul. There's a number of people who have said that in the chat. I am totally behind that, 100%. I, I want to see that, that film. So get on that, SF. We really want that, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough this evening for kind of sharing all of those insights. I think there's so much there that we can use in the classroom, that we can draw on. I mean, Rich, you and I have talked several times, haven't we, about how we draw on that work. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> many questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much more we could talk about, isn't there? And I think lots of people are, are, are commenting in the chat about things. So, Esther, thank you so much for your time this evening. And I know you engage really well on uh, social media with lots of teachers. So anyone watching and listening tonight that wants to get in touch I know you know SF always responds on Twitter you know please you know use that because it's such a good conduit for children to see authors and hear authors the authentic voices it makes such a difference and of course we're excited for Tiger we can't we can't wait to see that so thank you so much this evening uh, much. for joining us SF thank you um Teresa it's back to you actually but thanks Rich yeah. as well for joining me but um back to you for the Bookway. I just thought we might give SF one last kind of voice over. You've got such a lot of passion and, and uh, commitment to this agenda. What one thing, SF, would you say would make more difference in our schools where we want to make a difference to children reading for pleasure? You can just got one recommendation. You can't blur it into three. You've only got one. One thing, what's going to make the difference? I mean, I, I always say you've just got to follow your own enthusiasms, whatever they are, you know. So if you as a teacher genuinely love a book, you know, whatever you're going to be holding up in the book wave tonight. Uh, I, I, I have mine already here. You know, if you love it, share the love. You know, that is going to be more powerful than you can imagine. That would be my suggestion. Great. Thank you very much. Great suggestion. Can I recommend then that everybody put yourselves on gallery view so we can grab your book for this giant book wave and we can see everybody in the room turn off the chat line and get as many as possible. But most of you are 184 teachers who are giving up their evening. How wonderful is that to listen to SF and to get brilliant recommendations? So... Uh, our people who are taking photographs, please make sure you got the people in the photograph. And let's find out what SF is waving. Where have you gone? Oh, what um, have you got? The Wheel of Surya by Jamila Gavin. Uh -huh. which I think is an amazing, amazing book. Oh, you must read it. It's one of the great, great children's books of all time. Deserves to be much better known. I just don't even know it at all. Okay. Steph, what about you? Can I do a call out? What do you got? Uh, you can, yes. I've got Can You See Me? It really made me think. It's from the perspective of a, an autistic young lady. And gosh, it made me think. Cat How, brilliant book. And I think it's one, another one in the series. So that's wonderful. Let's go to somebody else. Karen Tullock, what you got there? Thank you. It's the May Jemison book. I was just using it today, so it just pulled out of my bag. <laughs> uh -huh. Tell us something about it. Go on. Uh, so it's the story, it's, it's very brief, a very simple picture book, the story of um, first 
uh, African American woman in space. Thank you, African American woman in space. As helped along by my son there. <laughs> yes, I was going to say a younger <laughs> voice came in to help us. Excellent. Good evening and welcome to you too. Okay. Last year, SF side in the call. And he thinks you're very cool, SF, so that's wonderful. That's very kind, thank you very much. In the corner, Bev Hickman, I've just bought that, so just tell us about it, please, fledgling. Uh, I'm about three or four chapters in, and it's um, very unusual, set in uh, the turn of the century in Germany, and uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I can't wait to find out. Brilliant. Thanks so much. I'm just jumping to people. I can see Angela Parsons. Over to you. Could you share us about what you've got? Not Lost something? Yes, this is Mini Rabbit Not Lost. It's funny. It's delicious. It's silly. Um, the children love it. Thank you. What an absolutely perfect recommendation. Funny, delicious, silly. The children love it. You know a teacher when you meet one like that who can do that in a summary form. Go for it. Uh, can I suggest that everybody moves the screen so that you can see others? If you click your right arrow, maybe you've already done it six times, but you can see other books all over the place. With somebody sharing Ruth Clark, sharing Wild Child, uh, and Claire Pinnock, Pinnock, what are you sharing? Could you share with us, please? Do you mind turning your mic on and just saying? Go for it. Uh, hi. Um... A rest, which is one I've just finished, and it's a great sci fi story. It's about children, it's obviously set in an alternate universe, children Brilliant. lost in space. All the adults are incapacitated and they have to try to return home. Okay, thank you. Lovely to see Miss Newton with October, October. Couldn't be better if you tried. Uh, in my view, life size dinosaurs, Linda Grant. Anything to tell us about that one, please? Yes, um, I shared, shared this with my um, my six year old, and I've took it into school. I teach year three at the moment, and everyone who's teaching in primary at the moment knows how difficult fitting in the maths curriculum has been. But the illustrations and how they pop out and pull out and it unfold, and they're enormous. Um, so I've been using it in my maths lessons, and it's gone down a treat. Great. A pop out, pull out. Sounds brilliant. Last one I'm going to call out is Georgie Star Georgie Lax from Starcross rather than Georgie Starcross. Over to you. What are you sharing? Hi, Teresa. Um, I've got the Pirate Mums here, which is uh, great. It's about a little boy who has two mums and they have a great adventure. Also, I noticed in the back of this one, uh, your entry, Tisha and the Blossom is a recommended in the back of that one. So. Well, that's a piece of roundedness for us. Okay, great. Well, we're closing now. Nearly time for gin and tonic, as uh, folk uh, keep telling me I mentioned. I don't know why I must be obsessed with gin and tonic. So Rich Charlesworth texted me before the event going, don't mention the gin and tonic. So I just did. Whoops. Uh, but I did want to mention three pieces of research that you might be interested in. I know they're going to be popped in the chat line. So do look out for them. Uh, one is a... Uh, an, an article that we've done as a group of colleagues at the Open University on exploring what this concept of reading for pleasure is. Because I think actually it gets quite muddled, maybe not in this room of 180 people or whatever, but in some rooms and by some head teachers who tend to see reading for pleasure as any time the children are enjoying their literacy lessons. Well, reading for pleasure is choosing to read. And just because somebody reads to you doesn't mean you've chosen it. And that isn't necessarily leading you to choose to read for yourself. So if you're interested in that one, do have a recce uh, at that. Uh, another one by uh, Roger McDonald going in the chat line, which is around student teachers as readers. And we've been doing some research with student teachers across 11 different um, universities and finding depressingly that they're rather reliant on Dahl and Williams and other books from their own childhood who can really blame them in a sense if that's what they've known and they're needing to widen that knowledge as they move into teacher education so whether you've got a student teacher or not um, you know regardless uh, do make sure you recommend new books to them and the third one is a, a paper by a colleague and myself uh, Aneshka Kazmikova who's from Prague and we've been exploring how children's um, reading of text takes them to different places in their worlds 
in the beaches they've been to, in the forest they've walked in, in the uh, library they've been to, or, or in the backyard, and how that is actually quite an equivalence, particularly when you look at uh, realistic genre, so, you know, home genre. So if we look at different kinds of genre, children can go to those places imaginatively, but when you get to close, a realistic genre, children, all children, find that easier to get a visual of and to connect to. So all three of those, maybe something you want to dip into one or other of them uh, to follow up tonight. And so it's just my a privilege to say thank you very much, particularly to Debbie Thomas, who's organised all this, to SF, who joined us so graciously and had some pithy things that have gone out on Twitter. Gracious me, I was I'm thinking, write them down, Teresa, write them down. But I was trying to take photographs at the same moment. Uh, and thank you to all the presenters. I won't name you all now in case I miss one of you out. But thank you all for sharing your book recommendations and your rich practice and for everybody else who joined us. It's time for a G&T, folks. I hope to see you in the autumn if we do another one of these. Take care.